psychopharmacology for kids and adolescents. Okay. Uh, I want This is my first exposure to this when I was a kid. Some of you that are my age might remember the Little Rascals. Okay. It's always nice to hear that there's still some of us around here remember that. So, uh, anyway. This was the, the woman, this cranky old lady who uh, ran the orphanage. And these kids had severe behavioral problems. Like, for instance, they had way too much glee. You know? <laughs> they would, like, run and jump and laugh and stuff. And that just, you know, that's, you know, you just got to do crowd control here. So what she would do then is she would administer them castor oil, which, uh, you know, tastes horrible. And, and they, they would, you know... This is some kind of punishment, I guess. So early on, uh, I started learning about child psychopharmacology when I was about six or seven. Now, here are some issues in treating kids. First off, no true informed consent. You're an adult, and somebody tries to sell you on taking a drug, you can say, forget it, I'm out of here, and you don't have to take it. All right? Not so with minors. Okay? Who's going to decide it's going to be their parents? Now, um, here, here's, here's something that though I think is really important to say, and, and this is just not my personal opinion, but the, the uh, child psychiatry uh, experts say this, that in kids, it's, although they're not, they don't give the final say-so you know, on whether they're going to take a drug or not, it really is important to talk to them, and especially after the age of seven. Under seven, there may not be enough cognitive development, uh, but for normal IQ kids, uh, excuse me, seven years of age and older is, is to sit down and have the prescriber or the therapist, whoever it is, say, look, uh, we're thinking about using a medication and here's the reasons why, but I want to know, what do you think about this? Now, a lot of kids, when they're with authority figures, are going to uh, collapse into compliance. Oh, it's okay. You know, or, well, if my parents want me to, I'll do it. Uh, but a lot of times that's really not the truth. You know, I mean, they're, they're just trying to be compliant. Uh, so, so to kind of take it beyond that, say, well, okay, maybe yes, maybe no, but let me just ask you something, okay? And that is, most kids I've seen, they know other kids that have taken these medicines. I mean, do you know anybody that takes Ritalin? Well, practically every kid's going to say, yeah. You know any kids that take antidepressants? Yeah, I do. You know, well, what, what do you know about these drugs? And, uh, you know, what do, your, what do your friends say? And, and, you know, it ranges all the way from, well, you know, you're going to get addicted to these drugs, or it means you're crazy, uh, or, you know, I mean, it's all kinds of negative stuff. You know, kids get teased about this. And, and, and so, really talking about this and basically saying, listen, I'm listening to what you're saying. Now, look, here's the bottom line, and that is your parents and I are going to decide about this, but you're, how you feel about this matters. And, and that's why we're talking about it, okay? And, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the downsides. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to talk to you about some potential benefits for you. And, and, there's, and, and this book, the one on adherence, is really good about helping to, to approach these issues that really accentuates how it can help improve the quality of life and things like that. Uh, but the point is made that this is not just about being decent to this child, which in itself it would be important, but also if a kid is going to get psychiatric medicines, the likelihood is they don't have you know situational stress. They've got some kind of big new psychiatric disorder, like bipolar disorder or OCD or something like that, which may mean they're going to be in mental health treatment for the rest of their life. And honest to God, the first encounter they have with the person who's dealing with this whole issue about medication can set the tone for how they're going to be, feel about openness to getting helped. And so, you know, 10 years later, this kid who's been treated for OCD is going to think back, you know, that, that guy who first prescribed the medicine, you know, he's a pretty good guy. I mean, he, he actually, he talked to me and so, you see, it really sets a stage, uh, I think, for kids feeling better uh, about seeking treatment. Uh, so we want to find out the meanings of taking medicine. Uh, it can range from, you know, people think I'm stupid or I'm crazy or what have you. Addressing parental fears. Now, this also is another one that requires some, some time to talk about. Some parents will come right in there and they'll be defensive about this from the get-go. And if you try to stand on your head and convince them that the medication is going to uh, be, you know, a good thing for their kid, good luck. Because the compliance rates... Uh, with children are, are horribly low and lots of that is because the parents don't believe in the medication treatment or they forget or you know what have you. 
And so I think that, that in the 20 minute visit with a pediatrician, which oftentimes is what happens when these kids walk out of there or their parents do with a prescription for Adderall or Ritalin or something, uh, there's not enough time to talk about this. And, and I believe in just let you lay the cards on the table and this is, have the kid be out of the room, talk to the parents, look, let's talk about this, okay? Now, I'm, I'm going to be telling you some, some um, my suggestions about medications. I'm going to talk about benefits and some limitations and risks. But you know what first thing is? I want to know what you think about this. Because they've got their opinions. And a lot of these people are afraid their kids are going to get addicted. And I, my older son's been a year in a rehab unit because he was addicted he was severely abusing marijuana. It's a horrible nightmare, and and it's it's very understandable. But if you just try to sell them on this, but they don't really get to voice their concerns, then you might as well go spit into the wind. Really, even if it means we don't have a prescription today, we need to meet three or four or more times and really talk about this. And if this just doesn't work, we'll try something else other than medication. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Now it turns out there's there's data that you can show people and and one and we'll get to the specifics later but one is there's two very good studies now that show that if you have adolescents who have ADHD and they are untreated versus those who are treated with stimulants that the, the untreated adolescents have twice the rate of substance abuse as the ones that are treated. Now why? Okay, number one ADHD kids don't get a buzz off of stimulants, so they don't abuse that, okay? But more importantly than that is that ADHD, it ruins your life. You fail at everything. You fail at school, okay? You fail in the family, family conflict all the time. Also, these ADHD kids, uh, other kids don't like them. I mean, you can, I've seen some ADHD kids who have very good heart. You know, they don't, they don't have conduct disorder or, or oppositional disorder, but they have ADHD. But they, they bug the hell out of other kids. You know, they're intrusive and, they, and they, they're in your face too much. They don't have you know, appreciation for appropriate space, you know, and, and, they, and they just bug the hell out of people. You know, they pull their sister's hair and all kinds of stuff like that. And, and so they don't get invited to sleep over. Uh, they don't get invited to birthday parties, and they're failing at school. And, and what's a common solution for profoundly low self-esteem and depression for teenagers is substance abuse. Okay, but, I, I'm, but I'm here to tell you. Maybe I'm just stating the obvious. If you start off with that, and you haven't addressed the issues of the parents' fears, it's not going to go anywhere. So I think that's why I really sitting and talking with them will we'll make a difference. Now, the, the final thing on the list up here, the drug is going to fix everything. Well, you know, Dr. Preston, I saw on Oprah the other day that this thing, this is a chemical imbalance in the brain. And, uh, of course, I get most of my mental health information from Oprah myself, and so I know, I know what they're talking about. Uh, but it's this notion, uh, and there, there's a place for this. I mean, uh, understanding bipolar disorder, is being driven by an underlying neurobiological condition. Same thing with ADHD. There's a place for that's true, okay? But, but the downside is that uh, parents may start thinking that the drug is going to make you know, everything okay. And of course, the big problem there is the drugs don't make everything okay. But worse than that, may sidestep the issue that maybe there's a lot of uh, very significant psychological issues that won't be addressed. And unfortunately, in some settings, the name of the game is behavioral control, not uh, really resolving suffering. Okay. Uh, kindling theory is uh, where a disorder, with each episode, it makes the disorder worse. And this was clearly uh, demonstrated decades ago with epilepsy. You keep having epileptic seizures and Epilepsy begin, uh, begets epilepsy. It just gets worse and worse and more severe and more frequent. And as we talked about before, the role of brain damage. Now, with uh, recurrent major depression, that's 80% of people's major depression, bipolar disorder, okay, absolutely good evidence for progressive brain damage if you don't treat, okay. And we're going to see that there's some preliminary research that they might be true, although to a much lesser degree, with ADHD and maybe with schizophrenia.
Okay, so this is another issue: is uh, you get kids that have early on. Usually, the early onset versions of these disorders are much more severe. They're much more malignant. They're harder to treat, and, and and if you waste a month or two, even it'll start getting out of control. So, so jumping in and pulling out all the stops and trying to get a lid on the you know first episode of psychosis or the first manic episode or something like this uh, becomes very important because otherwise it sets the stage for progressive brain damage and and the bottom line is then that uh, people are harder to treat